Today at the National Press Club, epidemiologists and immunisation experts Robert Boy, Mary Louise McClaws and Sanjaya Senanaika. As Australia prepares to roll out the coronavirus vaccine, they'll be answering questions about the approval and development process from the National Press Club in Canberra. Yuma, hello and welcome to the National Press Club of Australia for today's Westpac Address. I'm Misha Schubert, a Vice President of the Club, and I also happen to be the CEO of Science and Technology Australia. We're broadcasting today live from the nation's capital, and so we honour the Ngunnawal and Ngambri people who have lived this country and loved this country through the vastness of time. Today we bring you a very special event. In coming weeks, Australia will commence the largest national vaccine rollout in our history. So today we wanted to bring you a special forum to give the public, you at home, as well as our working journalists in the media, the chance to ask questions about the rollout, vaccine development and the continuing evolution of Australia's COVID response. Three eminent experts on vaccines, epidemiology and public health have agreed to share their expertise with us all today. And when we did a similar forum at the outset of the pandemic last year, it turned out to be our most watched broadcast of 2020. Robert Boy is an Honorary Professor of Paediatrics and Child Health at the University of Sydney, and he's also the former Head of Clinical Research at the National Centre for Immunisation Research and Surveillance at Westmead Hospital. Mary Louise McClaws is Professor of Epidemiology, Hospital Infection and Infectious Disease Control at UNSW Sydney, and a member of the World Health Organisation's Network of Global Experts on COVID-19. And Sanjaya Senanaika is the Infectious Disease Physician at, in Canberra and an Associate Professor of Medicine at the Australian National University's Medical School. If you're watching or listening across the country today, we would love you to join the online conversation. Just tag our handle at Press Club Aust, A-U-S-T, and use the hashtag NPC. So let's get underway. Would you please join me in welcoming our first speaker, Professor Robert Boy. Well, it's a, it's a privilege and a real challenge for me to be speaking here today. I've not done that before. SARS-CoV-2, the virus, causes COVID-19 disease and it's turned the world upside down. My expertise is in infectious disease prevention. My training is in vaccinology, epidemiology and clinical medicine. I helped to form what's called the Oxford Vaccine Group more than 25 years ago when I started my research career in Oxford. Today I wish to briefly reflect on the many vaccines that have come uh, uh, into being in less than a year and which we're about to use uh, or, and we are using around the world. I hope to illuminate or at least to inform discussion about the vaccine rollout. More than half a dozen vaccines have already reported very high levels of protection especially against severe disease, hospitalisation, death. 90 to 100% protection. Wow. But it's very hard to compare the different vaccine studies because they're not comparable because they have differences in their study designs, who they include, what endpoint they use, and so on. Generally, they include healthy people with fewer medical problems. They don't have diabetes or, um, or uh, lung disease often. Some studies are better at including people with lots of uh, risk factors in people for disease. So the real world protection that we expect will be less and 90 to 100% against severe disease may hold up in best settings, but it may be less in other places. I'd like to talk about though, and a potential additional benefit that people have not discussed to this point about the uh, AstraZeneca vaccine, especially in the South African population, where it does appear to be less effective and you would have heard reports in the last two days. Well, in counterbalance, we know that the virus has mutated and it appears to be less well protected against by vaccine. Uh, we've had reports in the last week of Johnson & Johnson, of Novavax, having 90% protection, but then in South Africa, only 60% or so. <clears throat> I'd like to contend that the effect in South Africa may not just be the virus, but it might also be the population, the people. 
Because they live in such a crowded situation, in many cases, apart from a few rich people, they have a much higher force of infection so the virus can spread more easily from person to person. So a virus uh, vaccine like um, Johnson & Johnson or AstraZeneca that appears less effective may be partly to do with the population and the behaviour. So a 60% effectiveness in South Africa might actually be 80% in a richer country with less crowding and a better health system. Now the South African variant is worrying us. I'm not trying to downplay it, I'm just trying to put it in perspective. It has arisen through natural mutations. In, in flu, we call that genetic drift. And it's not a result of vaccine. It's not because of vaccine-induced antibody. New viral variants are emerging all the time, and a new one comes to dominate about every three months. So the one that dominated a year ago has long since gone, and we're dealing with other variants. We are going to get a new variant it just doesn't have a name yet. It might be called Canberra, but I hope not. <laughs> Importantly and interestingly, these new variants, and now I'm going to be positive again, are likely to mutate and tend to cause milder disease over time. Indeed, all the clever virologists I know are saying within two to three years, it may be more like a cold than the severe pneumonia that's currently occurring. So that's pretty encouraging. It's a speculation. It's based on previous coronaviruses doing that. It's based on flu virus doing that. We had a pandemic 11 years ago of flu. It now mainly causes milder disease. So another current concern is protection of the elderly. We've got a vaccine for, that is being developed, is being manufactured, is about to be rolled out, 50 million doses in Australia. That's the AstraZeneca product, a viral vector product. That vaccine has not been adequately tested in the elderly. But what does that mean? What does that mean? It means that there's a lack of information, not that the vaccine isn't working. And we need more studies, and they started them last year, and they did it in elderly people in the US. And given that they report every few weeks and provide new publications, and I read them for hours on end to understand them, we're gonna have another report within weeks, probably, about the elderly in US population. So the TGA will be uh, informed of that and they'll then make analyses uh, and in real time they'll make decisions and we'll hear about it very quickly. Did you know that over 20 agencies already in the world have approved the AstraZeneca vaccine and generally included older people? We know that the EU, in terms of its overarching regulatory body, the EMA, the European Medicines Agency, has approved the vaccine across the ages 16 up to elderly. However, about a dozen EU individual countries have said, we're not gonna use this in people over 65. So the TGA has a real challenge to make sense of the data and make a good decision. What may not be well known is that over 20 agencies around the world have already approved the Russian vaccine. It's also a viral vector vaccine. It's very interesting. They deal with the first dose with one virus as the, the vector, and the second dose with a different virus. Both adenoviruses, both cause very mild colds. And because they're not replicating, they don't cause disease at all. But that's been uh, passed by regulators in 20 countries. So it's not some spoof from the Russians. It's real data with a vaccine that appears to be working well. So researchers around the world have learned extremely fast. Just a brief comment about the mRNA vaccine, Pfizer, Moderna, and others. It is quite extraordinary. We've never had a vaccine like that registered before, but we've been working on it for 10 years. So it's not as if it's a new platform. We've just got better at it because we've thrown money and people. So this mRNA vaccine in two large studies has reported 95% protection. Great, especially against severe disease. So that's um, uh, really encouraging. What's even more amazing about it is that they can uh, re revise it, change it, update it within two months and manufacture a new product within weeks after that. I mean, that's just extraordinary. 
That's never been possible before. So the other methods are a bit slower, like the method we're using with the viral vector with uh, uh, CSL Securus and uh, Oxford University. What they've learned is a few simple things, which I won't um, go on too much about. A two-dose approach does seem to be more protective, especially if you widen the interval between, so that if you have two to three months, the immune system is trained much better to respond more strongly the second time. And there's also growing evidence that you can prove the vaccine is likely to be effective if you simply take a blood sample from someone who's vaccinated, go to the lab and mix it with virus, get neutralization, and that is a proxy for protection. So in the future, we may be licensing vaccines on much simpler data, requiring only hundreds of people, not tens of thousands as we currently do. So because of these blood tests, we do have some confidence that the AstraZeneca vaccine will work uh, in the elderly in Australia. And we remember too, that all the other vaccines that have included the elderly have shown protection in the elderly, and they have similar blood type tests as well. So we've got reasons for confidence, but we don't have as much data as we want. Mild, mild disease may be less well protected against by vaccine, but that's always been the case with vaccines. They tend to prevent severe disease and hospitalization better. But mild disease, there may be some protective effect, and then that may translate to preventing transmission and give better herd immunity. But that's the topic for other people to discuss, and I'm happy to, happy to cover, cover that in questions, but there isn't time to talk about it now, and other people will, will, will deal with it. I could talk for hours, but I'm on my last page. My teleprompter is telling me. Um, so to conclude, we have three very good vaccines in Australia, and we're going to roll out very soon. The TGA has a very important task, and we can't second guess them because they have information we don't have and they get it before we get it. And they have the expertise to, to evaluate it very well. We know from a bunch of trials that vaccines are effective and safe for about three months. Not that they stop being effective and safe, we just haven't had follow up for more than three months. And so as part of TGA approval, it will be vital and it is intended that every vaccine is followed for at least two years for safety and effectiveness. And that will be part of their conditional uh, licensure. At some point quite soon, we won't be able to do randomised control trials. And the reason is obvious, not just that they're extremely expensive. We can't deny people in the control group vaccine when it works. So we can't be going on giving placebos on and on against a disease that can kill you. So we may well benefit looking forward from what's called a heterologous approach. That's where you use one vaccine for the first dose to get the immune system going and provide protection for at least a few, couple of months, and then a second, slightly different vaccine the second time. And that will, might give a broader, better, protective immune response. So that might be one way of dealing with uh, concerns about one vaccine versus another. Use two and get an even better response, perhaps. <clears throat> Vaccination is not a panacea, despite uh, the fact that I've devoted my career to the study of vaccines, they're part of the big picture. So they're a fantastic addition to all the other measures we're currently doing. We won't be able to stop washing hands and social distancing. That will remain important for months, if not a few more years. But vaccines will make a big difference. Thank you for your attention. We now welcome to the podium Professor Mary Louise McClaws. Thank you, Robert, for setting the scene. Um, so I've had the fortune or misfortune of having experience with, uh, with SARS in 2003. So from an epidemiology perspective, uh, I'm very uh, precautionary. 
So you will hear a precautionary approach uh, to uh, handling this outbreak, but particularly how we're going to ensure that some of these uh, variants of concerns, these strains, are going to impact on uh, the rollout of this very important uh, vaccine program. Uh, now we've seen today, sadly we have reached an envious case number of 107 million cases in the world and 2.3 million deaths and the trend in deaths is not going down yet. The second key um, take home or trend at the moment is a seven day um, pattern that European and the Americas continue sadly to contribute the majority of cases to our global uh, case numbers. 82% of all cases, 81% of all deaths. Therefore, we are at constant risk in our quarantine program. In terms of case numbers, it would have been reasonable to expect that high GDP countries would have the knowledge, the strategy and the resources to use low tech uh, public health, hand hygiene, masking, keeping distance and augmenting with testing. And what you would have seen was a very low number of infections in high GDP countries. And I've graphed this and found that sadly, the only ones that have managed that include Norway, Singapore, Australia, Hong Kong, Finland, New Zealand, and Japan per million population. So we are in an envious position, but so should the rest of those high GDP countries. So what we have is the should have and the could have countries. And the countries that are quite frankly shameless um, in their lack of controlling the pandemic with very low tech resources sadly include uh, the US, UK, France, the Netherlands, Sweden, Israel, uh, Switzerland. And they could have done better. There, of course, are the countries with uh, a medium GDP that uh, should have been able to do better. And then, of course, the countries with the low GDP have done better per million. But now, instead of being in a position where we in high GDP countries could uh, protect the rest of the world from our excellent um, interventions, we are now seeing national um, vaccination approach where we're rushing to be vaccinated and certainly the US, the UK and uh, South Africa really need this vaccine instead of we in the high GDP uh, being able to continue with this low tech approach so that the rest of the world, the, we have 7.7 .7 billion people, the rest of the world could have been vaccinated first, making everybody safe. As Dr. Tedros at WHO says, none of us are safe until all of us are safe. So now I'll just remind you of what Robert has reminded you about uh, the variants of concern, the strains. So we have variants of concern that are at risk of seeding our community. And it therefore makes it very important that we have no breaches at all in our quarantine program, none. We have uh, the B117 from the UK that took just four months to become uh, the circulating virus at something like 83% of all circulating strains. The South African virus took just three months. And yesterday, of course, we've heard that sadly in the average age of about 31 in 2000 people, it looks as if their vaccine won't protect them at any more than about 40%. And then there's the Brazilian strains, and that became the uh, variant uh, that circulated and the predominant variant in one month. 
And therefore, I constantly remind you that we do need to shore up our quarantine program. It can't be great. It has to be the very best. And we have to have a national approach with very best practice. So about a month ago, I published a calculation, a simple calculation, that with this very um, challenging rollout for Australia, we needed to vaccinate 170,000 Australians per day for 240 days. That's an enormous uh, undertaking. And it's an undertaking that we need to help the authorities by keeping our distance, hand hygiene, wearing masks when we're asked, but also by the quarantine program being the very best it can be. And sadly, we have heard today that there are five cases um, that have leaked into the community potentially by staff. And the staff are very important. And I'm very pleased to hear that they're getting the Pfizer vaccine. So, uh, but we can take a great deal of learning from the three countries that have rolled out or started to roll out their national program. Israel, the UK, and the USA. And they've been doing this for seven to nine weeks. And what we can learn from this is that it does take many weeks to reach the peak at the rollout. And the peak for Israel, yes, it's nine um, million people, reached 172,000 injections per day. And remember, I'd calculated we needed about 170 to get about an 80% coverage. Uh, of course, when your uh, population gets bigger, the UK has only been able to uh, get over just over 400,000 per day. And of course, the US have lifted their game and have got to 1.7 million injections per day. It's an enormous undertaking, and it can be done. But I would stress to everybody in Australia that when it's your turn to get vaccinated, get vaccinated. And I'm going to just take you through some um, sobering a reminder that this vaccine is not the silver bullet, the magic bullet, but it's the only bullet that we have to help us with the low-tech um, interventions. So having a look at um, what we would need to get herd immunity, the Pfizer and AstraZeneca that is in our portfolio at the moment have not been able to provide evidence, and they will eventually, about whether or not they have what's called transmission blocking capacity. In other words, protecting us from not just getting severe infection, getting any infection and transmitting it. But as Robert has mentioned, there's a great possibility that this will happen and we will hear more about this. But nevertheless, I redid some calculations. And of course, with the Pfizer, uh, it has a 95% protection. And we can uh, roll that out uh, to fewer in our population to get herd immunity in the absence of any variance of concern at about 70% of the population. But once you add just even, the UK variant, not the South um, African variant, the UK, we'd have to roll it out to about 85% of the population. So if we look at the AstraZeneca, and I've taken best case scenario, um, I've taken that, of course, it will um, protect us in the 80% range, 82%. We would still need, with AstraZeneca and the Pfizer, to, at the 40-60 ratio, to have at least 75% of the population covered. If you add, of course, the variant, that increases, of course, to about 80%, and even further. And, of course, if you have a look at when AstraZeneca hasn't done well in either the UK when it gets to about 70-odd percent protection and, of course, in Brazil with less protection in the 50, you have to roll it out to even more people. So if we need any more lessons and we need to lessen up quickly and learn, we need to roll this out to everybody. And I would commend everybody to take whatever vaccine they are offered, because we need as many Australians as possible. Now, these vaccines aren't perfect. Um, we will need about 160,000 to about 190,000 injections per day. 
Um, and that's going to take a lot of challenge by our authorities, and we need to help them reach that amount. They are coming up with great ideas to use uh, pharmacy, uh, GPs, etc., and that will be much easier with the, Pfizer, with the sorry, AstraZeneca vaccine. Um, so I did some calculations on what will happen if you have the vaccine, particularly the um, AstraZeneca, and you may not be protected. And with the 40-60 ratio, we could have between 13 and 25 percent of our population, including our guests, because we need to cover them as well, uh, that will not be protected. And we really need to think very seriously about what to do about that. But Robert has mentioned the idea of what's called mix and match. And in fact, if we can learn from the South African experience, and they may well, because they've placed their rollout on pause, they may well choose to do a mix and match with the second uh, dose. So use uh, Johnson & Johnson or Moderna or one other. And this may be an opportunity for us to think about doing the same thing, because we need to protect everybody, because if we got up to 25% that are not going to be covered, then we could still have a circulation going round and round. Just to remind you that we come from all different countries. Our families come from around the world, and we will be opening up our borders probably next year. I can't see them opened up before then. And we will be traveling and receiving our family members. To ensure that we are safe, please get vaccinated. So just to reiterate, to have the very, very best uh, chance of putting an end to this uh, virus and to getting back to some semblance of normality, we need to remember that there's constantly a, um, an enemy. And instead of um, going at the enemy as separate states and territories. We need to go at this enemy as a nation and have the very best of each one of the state's experiences with the quarantine program. Learn from that so that we don't get any leaks. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor McCloys. We now welcome to the podium Associate Professor Sanjaya Senanayika. Ladies and gentlemen of the press, honoured guests, my esteemed colleagues, I've been asked to talk about COVID and the future, which is no mean feat. Unfortunately, I, I do not have my crystal ball or tea leaves with me today, but I shall endeavour to do my best. But let's start with the present and look at the global vaccine rollout. At this stage, over 140 million people have received a dose of vaccine. Now, the US is leading the way in terms of the number of people who've received a dose of vaccine and the number of people who've received a dose of vaccine daily. But a, probably a better indicator of the success of the program is the percentage of people in your population who've been vaccinated. And so far, Israel and the United Arab Emirates leads the way. Now, those three countries that I've mentioned should be well on the way to achieving 75% coverage of their populations within the year. So does this mean we'll be able to eradicate COVID, get rid of it from the world? Well, let me tell you, we've only ever eradicated one infectious disease. That was smallpox, and that took a lot of hard work. Interestingly, the coronavirus precursor of COVID SARS has disappeared from the face of the planet, but that is a great mystery. At the other end of the spectrum, we have four circulating coronaviruses that cause the common cold that have been around for decades. And I suspect that COVID is going to mirror the trajectory of those particular organisms, becoming a persistent presence in our society, leading to intermittent incursions causing some hospitalizations and deaths every year, but largely leaving untouched our vaccinated population. However, 
I see four obstacles getting in the way of us achieving that relatively harmonious symbiosis that I've just discussed. Two of them we're already very well aware of, which is we don't know the duration of immunity of these vaccines. And it may well be we're mixing and matching and giving an annual boast, uh, boost with the latest version. Also, we don't know by how much these vaccines reduce transmission of infection. The other two points, however, are intertwined. That is the global vaccine rollout and the emergence of new strains. Now, at the start of my talk, I said some positive things about the global vaccine rollout. However, there is a flip side. Only about 70 nations have started to vaccinate their populations. And at the current rate of vaccination, it is estimated we won't reach global coverage of 75% with vaccines for about six years. Not one or two years, but six years. In addition, Oxfam has said that by the end of this year, there will be 70 poorer nations where only one in 10 people have been vaccinated. So there is some inequity there. So we move on to these strains which have emerged and their emergence, I must admit, has been somewhat surprising at this stage of the pandemic. The most likely reason for this is the sheer volume of infections we've seen in the last 12 months where literally there have been hundreds of millions of opportunities for the virus to replicate and mutate into something more sinister. And if we continue this global vaccine rollout, while in other parts of the world infection continues unchecked, then we will see more sinister strains emerge which might have further impacts on vaccine efficacy. Therefore, if you are a believer in vaccine nationalism, wanting the best impact of vaccination in your own country, you also have to embrace vaccine altruism and ensure that vaccines are delivered in sufficient number and in a timely manner to the developing world. So this paradoxical pairing is necessary if we want to have some sort of harmonious coexistence with COVID. Now, I must say that the efforts of our vaccine researchers here in Australia and around the world have simply been magnificent to get us where we are today. However, when the first person in the US got their dose of vaccine on the 14th of December, 1.6 million people had already died from COVID. In other words, we needed that vaccine earlier. We needed that vaccine before the pandemic. Now, that sounds like an absurd or ridiculous notion, but it, that is exactly what organisations like the Coalition for Epidemic Preparedness Innovations are working on. You might say, why? It's been 100 years between the Spanish flu and COVID. Well, let me tell you, in the last 50 years or so, we've seen over 40 new infections appear. Our global population is growing. We are impinging more and more on natural habitats and interacting with wild animals. And our interconnectedness globally is nev has never been as great as it is now. Therefore, the next pandemic is not 100 years away. It is just around the corner. And what we have learnt from COVID is that a pandemic is, is not a niche area of healthcare. No, not at all. A pandemic with this microscopic leviathan that is SARS-CoV-2 has invaded every continent on the planet and pervaded every aspect of our lives. So I think here is an opportunity before we forget COVID, and it is true at some stage we will forget COVID, to galvanise into action the greatest minds, the greatest thinkers on the planet, not just the medical minds, but the Elon Musks and others like him, and get them to stop thinking about driverless cars and sending adventurous billionaires to space, and maybe focus on predicting and preventing the next pandemic, but if it occurs, ensuring that we have the correct medications and the correct vaccines available. And I should add, I have no issue with sending adventurous billionaires to space. It's bringing them back to Earth afterwards that's the problem. 
Anyway, I shall conclude by saying that we are in the midst of what is perhaps the most audacious global public health undertaking in history. There could be many complications and it could go wrong, but I really, really believe that we can get it right. Thank you. What a terrific upbeat note on which to, uh, to conclude those formal opening remarks from each of you um, about the idea that one day we might be able to forget COVID. Uh, we now move to a period of questions, including from our working journalists, but we also have some questions from the public at home. So I'm going to kick off with one of them before we move to Jane Norman from the ABC. Uh, Stephen Picard would like each of you to weigh in, or one of you to weigh in if you can, please, on the current estimates for the number of Australians we expect to be vaccinated but also to not be vaccinated and what risk that potentially poses to the rest of the population. So I'll start. So my calculations are that we need to vaccinate at, at least a 90 to 95% if we're covering, uh, of course, a variant of concern. If we're not, we need to cover at least 85% of the community. But I'd actually think about thinking about trying to do as many as possible so that uh, we can try to prevent a small, well, the smallest proportion as possible who may never elicit an immune response and get that number just smaller and smaller. Because if people just don't get vaccinated at all, they have no chance of developing immunity at all. So I would like to say all of us. In terms of who will and who won't get vaccinated, there have been a number of surveys out there, in fact, from the ANU here in Canberra as well. And from what I've seen, about 80% of the population either will get vaccinated or are likely to get vaccinated, and the other 20 either definitely won't or are unlikely to be. And I think there is an opportunity with ongoing education. And we were, uh, one of the surveys looked at uh, young adult women as being one group who were hesitant, that if we continue to target them, and target them and educate them, they might come to the way of the vaccine. And as Mary Louise said, if they don't get vaccinated, we're not protected. So it is uh, just so important. Jane Norman from the ABC. Hello, Jane Norman from the ABC. Um, thanks for your contributions today. I think this vaccine is a national obsession right now. So hearing from experts like yourselves is so helpful. Just picking up on the hope for 95% of the population to be vaccinated. Um, I'm just wondering, children are not currently part of the rollout of this vaccine. Um, I think the Pfizer jab has been approved for use for Australians over the age of 16. So are you suggesting that children should also be vaccinated maybe as part of a later stage of the rollout? And has there been any kind of testing any clinical data about whether that is sort of safe and effective for young people? Well, I'll defer to my colleague, but initially I'll say that WHO have identified that um, teenagers from about the age of 14 to 16 start responding to COVID in a very adult uh, manner. So you do want children at senior high school to start getting vaccinated. Uh, so we will have to start thinking about them. But the first group, and they are often a group that get infected through family uh, clusters. So you actually want to protect the adults first and the grandparents and visitors uh, first. Not that they're not important, um, but epidemiologically, um, they can wait. I'm a paediatrician and of course I'm an advocate for children, but children of primary school age get almost always asymptomatic infection apart from a rare manifestation that occurs six or ten weeks later. They are very unlikely to transmit between each other or even to their parents or to their school teachers. So they are potentially a uh, reason for vaccination but not a strong one. And, uh, and uh, having done research with adolescents and knowing how they like to mix, uh, they are uh, much more likely to need vaccination and to benefit from it and to prevent transmission between each other as a consequence of vaccinating them. So I agree with Mary-Louise. Uh, 
Jordan King would like to know, uh, how different has the approval process from these vaccines been compared to a regular process uh, that vaccines would go through in other countries? I know uh, several government ministers have pointed out repeatedly that Australia's process has been more like our normal process than the emergency listings that were uh, adopted in other countries with very large scale case numbers. Yeah, there are important differences and we're perhaps uh, taking a more careful approach uh, the emergency utilisation means that you can use it for a time, but maybe not for too long. Uh, and to uh, add to the concern about uh, how many people need to be vaccinated, well, two doses for as many as possible. But then again, in six to 12 months, we may, we may well need a booster. So it's not just a, a short term issue that we have to deal with. With these mutants, we may have escape. Uh, whereby the, the virus is not protected against and will need a, a new vaccine. And we also don't have that urgent need uh, as uh, America and some of the other high GDP countries that are really relying on this because they haven't been able to get cooperation from the public for very simple public health interventions. So we've, we're in a fortunate position, but uh, the sooner we start rolling out, the better because it will take some time. Yeah, we have timed it beautifully because, uh, as I was saying, that we have now seen over 140 million people get the vaccine. So that shows us that the vaccine is safe and hopefully will show us that it's efficacious as well. And hopefully that will fill those people who are hesitant with a bit more confidence. Tom Connell. Tom Connell from Sky News. I wanted to pick up on your point on uh, vaccine nationalism, Sanjay. Um, we've got, obviously, Pfizer already availability. AstraZeneca on the cusp of it. Uh, Novavax will probably have soon as well. And yet a lot of the talk here is, can we get more and more vaccine in Australia? It's a pretty staggering stat around poorer countries you gave there. What would you like to see the Australian government talk about or commit to? I know we're a part of COVAX, uh, but for example, would you like to see them talk about the AstraZeneca supply we can make ourselves and start talking about that, giving that or selling that overseas, some sort of specific allotments and a real strong commitment to that, given it's also important for ourselves? Yeah, look, I, I think that's very important. Now, vaccine nationalism, however, it isn't a bad thing. I, I think it's a really good thing because we would expect our government to protect our population. So that is important. And of course, the other thing we need is a bit of extra vaccine because as we saw with the UQ vaccine, that fell through and we therefore needed to find some more very quickly. So it is important to make sure you have got enough vaccine and a bit extra. But at the same time, you need to have plans in place. I would say formal plans in place to say, we need to allocate the vaccines to these countries, which now have an infrastructure in place to administer the vaccine. And uh, I think do so publicly so that there's no secrecy about it. And uh, I think that will fill me with confidence knowing that we're trying to help the rest of the world. Yes, I agree. From a public health perspective, um, you know, we all need to be vaccinated um, and we need to help our neighbours as well. I mean, we are in the Asia Pacific area. Um, a lot of families come from this area and uh, we need to help them uh, so that they're safe and we're all safe. Sue so Dunleavy. Hello, uh, Sue Dunleavy from News Corp Papers. Um, we've repeatedly been told that most Australians are going to get the AstraZeneca vaccine. We now know from clinical studies that it's not very effective at treating at least the South African variant. That raises a number of problems if vaccine confidence is crucial to this rollout. How do you overcome the fear that some people might have, I'm going to get a vaccine that's not actually going to work because if we get a South African outbreak here it won't protect me. Secondly, how are you going to stop a squabble between the people who are lucky enough to get the Pfizer vaccine, which is seen more effect as more effective than the AstraZeneca vaccine? Does the AstraZeneca vaccine provide any protection at all against the South African variant? And the whole vaccination program is being billed as something that's going to allow us to reopen our economy, to go travelling again. But if, it's not, if the vaccine that we've had does not protect us against the very virus mutants, then is it going to do what it is being sold as being able to do? So your, your concerns are reasonable, but 
let me put them into perspective. Um, in South Africa, the latest information is on about 2,000 people, uh, average age 31. And as Robert quite rightly pointed out, um, they're living in difficult circumstances that encourages not just spread, but also puts the virus under a lot of pressure to mutate. If we, and I have to remind everybody, AstraZeneca is safe. It is safe. Nothing bad will happen to you. It's very safe. You, you may not die from a severe infection, but what we all want is a vaccine that will keep us from getting infected. Now, first of all, my take would be, get the vaccine to prime your immune system. If we find that uh, after the rollout, it's not as efficacious as what is happening in the UK, which is in 70%, we actually might find in the real world rollout phase four that in fact it has even better efficacy, even better. So I think as both of my other speakers have mentioned, this is a constant evolving science and we need to be strong enough to cope with the change of science. So have your first dose. We may have another vaccine in our portfolio for a second dose. Uh, or some of you may be offered it as um, a trial run, as they're doing you know, potentially in other countries. Uh, but yes, it is a concern, but it's what we have. It's what it is. And it's a great thing that our frontline workers are getting the best one, because they're the ones that will leak the variants or the, vac or the, the, the virus into the community anyway because the only risk we have at the moment is return travellers. Now, morally, we need them back in their own country. But then we put the frontline workers at risk. They need the very best vaccine. And then when they don't catch it or they... And they've also found in Israel that, in fact, even if you do catch it after the Pfizer vaccine, that your viral load is very small. And that was based on a pre-publication um, uh, piece, uh, so that you're less likely to transmit it. There were about four or five questions there, so I'll, I'll try <laughs> to, to answer one of them. We really need to understand that that South African report is unpublished. It's in a tiny number of people, 2,000, not 20,000. It uh, is addressing a population that doesn't get severe disease, hardly ever. So the key endpoint of protection from severe disease has not been addressed. So the study is, in effect, irrelevant to our current considerations. We need better studies uh, in larger numbers over longer periods of time, and then we'll have a better understanding whether this vaccine is a problem for the South African variant or not. Yeah, but in terms of where, I think one of the questions was what it will mean for overseas travel. I think that's a rather vexed question at the moment. But we are going to take if we do it properly, about nine or 10 months to achieve the goal we have to. And it's going to take a lot of other countries a similar period of time or even longer. So until then, I suspect we aren't going to be too adventurous with opening our borders. Uh, we, there may be the opportunity for bubbles. Uh, I guess that bubbling we have with New Zealand, which uh, opens and closes every now and then when they have an outbreak or we have an outbreak. <laughs> Uh, but not much beyond that in 2021. I don't know what Robert and Mary Louise think about that. Well, I think it'd be, it's really important to have um, philanthropy, uh, as um, Sanjaya has mentioned before, so that we can keep our bubble, our uh, Western Pacific bubble, because most of our uh, families come from that area, mm -hmm. and a lot of our trade uh, comes from that area, so that we can keep them safe as well. I agree we should be really kind to our New Zealand cousins. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good rule to live by. Chloe Boris. <laughs> Chloe Boris from Network 10. Just on a slightly different topic, the investigation in Wuhan into the origins of coronavirus. Are you satisfied that the WHO investigators were given access to all the information they need and that this was a legitimate process? And from what we've heard so far about the findings, do you think they will help you know, achieve this harmonious coexistence that you referred to? Wow, um, it's, a, it's a really, it's a, it's a vexing one. Uh, the problem is it's a bit like uh, looking at your internal governance yourself. 
However, we do have an Australian on there, um, uh, Dr. Dwyer, uh, um, Dominic Dwyer. When he comes back, if he says that he has had full cooperation, he has. Um, my experience from SARS was that, and like the experience that we've seen nationally, where um, in China, initially, the local officials didn't respond as well as they should have, really. But the federal ones in um, uh, Beijing did. And that was my experience with SARS. The post-SARS, they really wanted to cooperate to learn. And I wrote a report with one of uh, their um, experts from uh, the Beijing Health Bureau. And that report was very, very open about the things they didn't do, the time they lost. Uh, they, I can only imagine with my experience from China is they really want to learn from this. Uh, they don't want to have to go through the hard lockdown, uh, the economy um, being stalled, all of those issues. Um, but I believe that once um, the WHO team come, come back, uh, but it's, it is disappointing that it, doesn't, it wasn't completely independent without the badging of WHO, um, but uh, there, are, there is an Australian there, uh, there are epidemiologists there um, who aren't staffers. So you have to understand, uh, like myself who does some work occasionally with WHO, uh, I'm not a staffer, uh, so you can go in with open eyes and independence. I've worked with Dominic for a long time. He's a very eminent virologist. He's a professor and head of New South Wales Health. He will give a reliable report. I heard him speak on the topic uh, by phone uh, on Sunday evening, and that's what he said. Uh, however, we have to know that uh, Bill Bertels and others have said that uh, access to information in China is limited. That's uh, just how it is. And so trying to determine what went on 15 months ago uh, is rather difficult, and being taken to a wet market now is almost immaterial. That is true. During SARS, it lasted for about six months. It's very different. Uh, you can go back and, and review uh, what happened with much fresher eyes. Uh, this has gone on for you know just over a year, so it is very difficult. Yeah. I guess in terms of whether it came from a lab in Wuhan, Chloe, as you, you were asking, that seems to be very unlikely. The closest virus, coronavirus, they found from that lab was um, something called RATG13, which was, which when you think about it, it's 96% homologous or similar to SARS-CoV-2, which you think 96%, that's, that's very close to 100. But apparently, in evolutionary virology, that's not close enough. So SARS-CoV-2 is unlikely to have come from a lab. That much we know. And then there are also other mysteries. For example, in France, it, it looks like the first case was probably there at the end of December rather than February when they looked back at a group of people who presented with flu-like illnesses and their samples were still present, and one of them was positive for COVID or SARS-CoV-2. And this was a person who had had no recent history of overseas travel or any links with China. So I think there are still some mysteries there which we may never solve. And just to remind you, SARS in 2003, 86% similar to this one, and there was no lab in Guangzhou. So, um, it, it's more likely to have come from the wild. And as the climate changes, we may see more of this sort of um, moving of um, diseases uh, of the animal world into the human world more often. So we really need to respect uh, both the climate and our um, and nature. Rachel Klein. Hi, Rachel Klein from the Sydney Morning Herald and The Age. Um, Professor McClaws said earlier that we need to vaccinate up to 190,000 uh, people per day. It involves two vaccines. We have the federal government, we've got state parts, we've got doctors, pharmacists. There are lots of moving components to this vaccine rollout. What do you see as some of the pinch points in that rollout? Well, Israel's pinch point in that rollout uh, was when they got up to um, about 170 odd per day uh, was the supply, so the supply let them down. And then they got their supply back up. And then the next pinch point was 
getting uh, the second cohort coming along to have their second um, dose. So running uh, clinics with both first and second doses. And of course, if we do a mix and match as well, that will be even more difficult. Uh, but then they've got their act together again. Uh, but now they've got a little bit of vaccine hesitancy going on. Um, and I'm hoping we won't have that as much as uh, in Israel. Uh, but there'll be lots of issues uh, and we just have to learn uh, to engineer around those issues and plan for worst case scenario. It's the planning that counts and it's not just medicos planning this, it's experts in getting you know, food from one end of Australia to the other fresh. You need a, a lot of experts in getting this ready. And there will be an opportunity at the start, I think we're, we're going to give about 80,000 vaccines a day at the very start, but then that will ramp up when CSL starts pumping out all these doses of the AstraZeneca vaccine. So at that early stage, we'll be able to identify and hopefully iron out any wrinkles in the program. Yes, and, and if they're clever, they'll pick up the phone and have a chat to Israel, the UK and the US to find out what were some of those pinch points uh, to be ready for them. That's a lovely segue for um, a very quick question from one of our members of the public watching along at home. Trish McKnight would like to know about reports in the UK about the sort of spacing between vaccination doses and would like you to uh, weigh in on how crucial is that timing between doses? It turns out to be much more important than anyone ever thought. We started off saying three to four weeks should be great. Get the immune system primed and then boost it. Actually, three months is great and much better. So the protection from the studies done with the AstraZeneca vaccine in the UK are that 55% protection after two doses, three or four weeks apart, 55%. If they're three months apart, 82% protection. Significantly better, it appears. And those confidence limits don't really overlap by more than a minimal amount. So it looks as though there's a real benefit from the longer gap. And what's important is, are you then protected by the first dose? And they seem to be uh, showing about 75% protection between three weeks and three months after your first dose. And then you get that lovely boost from the second. So I'd remind everybody that when they do have their injection, don't rush out and take your mask off if you're asked to wear it. You know, <laughs> be, be COVID safe. We're gonna keep moving along at a rapid clip. Olivia Caisley. Olivia Caisley from The Australian, thanks for your insight. I just wanted to pick up on something Dr Boyce said about vaccinating the elderly. As you mentioned, there's several European countries who've decided not to use the AstraZeneca jab for those uh, over 65 because of concerns about its efficacy in that age group. Do you think Australia should follow suit and await more data? That's why I emphasised very much the very important and difficult role of the TGA. And they have more information than any of us have. Uh, we're studying this as hard as we can and reading into the night, but they get the best reports and the earliest reports. There's, there's debate about what we should do. Personally, I think healthy older people would uh, benefit, but uh, stronger responses are given to the Pfizer vaccine and we're aiming to give particularly people with lots of comorbidities and lots of illnesses who are older that vaccine. It would be much harder to roll that vaccine out to GP practices, but not impossible. And I think therefore the, the possibility would be now that we have an extra 10 million doses of Pfizer, we can cover off on most of our vulnerable elderly people with that vaccine. But in rural, uh, remote areas, uh, even in peri-urban areas, it might be better uh, to access a vaccine that's transported at refrigeration temperature uh, and, and, and can be given and is known to be effective against severe disease once we get that data. So we're still waiting for some of that data from the US, but we already have the blood tests, which are a proxy, not the best, not perfect, but good, uh, a proxy for protection. And that seems to be that with people who are elderly in the UK who've had that vaccine, at least their blood shows protection and in time we'll know whether they truly are protected uh, in, in, um, in, their, in their home circumstances. There's one other good, um good news for the elderly is that they will be buffered if they are in residential aged care facilities or any home care, that those staff will be vaccinated with Pfizer. So that improves their protectiveness of the elderly. It's like a cocooning effect we, we see with uh, whooping cough. So when a, 
uh, a pregnant woman delivers a baby and goes home, you make sure that everyone in the household and grandparents, etc., are vaccinated against whooping cough just to reduce that risk to the baby. We're running really tight against time, so we're going to have to be really quick for our last few questions. Simon Gross. Uh, Simon Gross, Canberra IQ. Uh, the official uh, uh, title of today was What, When, How, I think, about vaccines and how I'm interested in. I tried to understand how the mRNA virus uh, vaccines are made, and it seems you, you GM um, E. coli and then you feed it up and then you smash it up, add a bit of oil, and that's your, um, your, that's your vaccine. Can someone uh, kind of uh, elucidate that a bit for, for, the, for the broader audience? A any reflections on the UQ vaccine saga? Look, uh, you do cover it with lipid, a bit of fat, and that helps it to get in to the muscle and to provoke an immune response. The mRNA is a message. It's genetic. It tells uh, the human cells to make um, uh, to, uh, to, to make the protein, and then our own immune system reacts against the protein. So uh, I think you know you don't need cell culture the way you do for Novartis. Uh, you can do it genetically much more easily. And the cassette, which is the the genetics for the spike protein, can be uh, replaced within days, and then they can manufacture it within weeks. So it's great. And the second point was the UQ. Uh... The UQ vaccine. Yeah, we've been talking to them and. Um, uh, they're trying a whole bunch of new and different ways. Good. They're still using the clamp technology, just a different protein. They could uh, produce something worthwhile later this year. Uh, there's a lot going on. I was only talking to them this morning. Yeah. Just say, I'm a simple-minded fellow. The way I think about this <laughs> is uh, if, if you think of the ingredients of a cake, butter, sugar, eggs, milk, that's your mRNA vaccine. It's delivered directly into the body's cells and the cell, the kitchen machinery in the cell makes a spike protein with that, releases it into the body system. The AstraZeneca vaccine, very similar, except you've got a delivery man, the adenovirus holding onto those raw ingredients. Delivery man goes into the cell, gets killed, and uh, <laughs> the spike protein is made by the cell and released into the system. So. Good. Science communication was the winner on the day. Very good. Uh, Andrew Tillett. Uh, Andrew Tillett from the Financial Review. Thanks for your presentation today. Um, Robert, you mentioned in your opening remarks about how even after the vaccine there will still have to be sort of social distancing, the, the hand, washing, hand washing message and things like that. Obviously international travel is off, off the agenda for months, maybe till next year. Um, what actually will we be able to do as a society when we are vaccinated, what is the sort of the, the trigger points, I guess, for things, um, you know, come August, September this year when we enter into footy finals, for instance, are we going to be able to have 100% crowds at the MCG for the grand final and things like that? Is the priority to vaccinate the, the elderly, those frontline workers, and then after that, the sort of the, the real sort of the clamps could come off on things? Well, we're already uh, experiencing the progressive relaxation and we're sort of testing it as we go biologically as to whether it works or not. The main pressure point at the moment is quarantine and people getting infected in hotels. We are in a tremendous situation. You don't need me to say that. Um, and so the reproductive number, the likelihood of one person infecting uh, a number of others has gone down remarkably through the simple measures that uh, Mary Louise was talking about. Um, we will be able to relax those. I'm, you know, we're not wearing, all wearing masks at the moment, um, but we are on the planes. We are going to be able to relax those. Uh, the vaccine will make a difference. The R effective reproduction number will continue to decrease with the use of vaccine. Uh, and so the prospect is bright. I think at least 50, maybe 75%, maybe even greater uh, participation at uh, uh, the Melbourne Grand Final. Can I, can I just say oh. that with the frontline workers at the quarantine hotels uh, or whatever system we're going to roll out eventually, um, they will be protected and they're the ones who are protecting the rest of us while we get our AstraZeneca. Uh, as a very precautionary epidemiologist, I'd like to hold off on any mass uh, meetings or sporting, but uh, once our front line are vaccinated with the two, vac uh, two doses, uh, we are in a much better position to start loosening up a bit. Yeah. Our last two quick questions, Sally White. Uh, thank you very much for this, Sally White from the Canberra Times. I wanted to ask about people who 
have comorbidities, have autoimmune diseases, uh, that kind of thing, things that make them more vulnerable to COVID, but then also mean that they are excluded from clinical trials. How do they make a decision about whether or not to get a vaccine that they haven't been part of the trials and they don't know what it means for them? Yeah, there will, there will always be at-risk groups who may not have been included in trials, but some of them, uh, particularly large ones of 30 or 40,000 people, have included a lot of comorbid uh, affected people. So we never have the ideal situation of knowing data in pregnant women, for example. We often exclude them because we don't want them or their baby to be damaged. Not that it will damage, but it may. So it's a matter of uh, doing the best evaluation of the data we have and then extrapolating from that um, to uh, a benefit-risk ratio of what's the likelihood of this person getting infection. Therefore, uh, if it's high, we want to be vaccinated. Mm -hmm and particularly responding badly to the infection. So, yeah. And, and just to add to that, uh, Israel has decided to vaccinate pregnant women. They've decided the benefits better than the, the, the disadvantages. Lucky last question, Sarah Eisen. Sarah Eisen from the West Australian. Um, Robert, you were mentioning all these different variants that we have had and are probably going to have for some time, and then how the mRNA vaccine and, and one of the vaccines can you know, be revised and changed, updated within months and manufactured within just weeks. What about the vaccines that can't do that? Won't they become pretty much obsolete as these new variants keep happening in the future? And we do have a vaccine that the mRNA and the, I think the Moderna that, that can do it so fast. Don't the other ones sort of become obsolete in comparison? Well, well briefly, we have a four component vaccine for influenza. It gets uh, revised every six months, Northern Hemisphere than Southern. So we can do it already. Um, we uh, are going to be forced into that. We'll get to a point where we might have to give bivalent two types of corona vaccine at the same time. Uh, so uh, the uh, viral vector approach would take more like six months to revise, but they're doing it already. They're already working on it. So, uh, you know, we're going faster than we've ever done and all we're going to do is accelerate. Right. Terrific. Uh, and that is a note on which we will conclude. I'm just looking for it. Yes, thank you so much. Thank you.